$1.33 billion recorded the previous month. The president's call for dialogue and collective action in his nationwide broadcast on Sunday has been welcomed by many, describing it as a reminder of a cohesive approach to governance that prioritizes the well-being of all Nigerians. Analysts say the president's speech is an acknowledgement of the challenges facing the nation and I hope to see uh, these addressing uh, the agitations of the protesters. Well, let's take a listen to uh, one of the sectors of the economy where President highlighted significant improvements from what used to be before he got into office. Take a listen. We are providing incentives to farmers to increase food production at affordable prices. I have directed that tariffs and other import duties should be removed on rice, wheat, maize, sorghum, and drugs and other pharmaceutical medical supplies for the next six months. Last month, we increased our oil production to 1.61 million barrels per day, and our gas assets are receiving the attention they deserve. Investors are coming back, and we have already seen two foreign direct investments signed over half a billion dollars since then. Let's get talking now. An investment strategy and management senior associate at Afri Invest West Africa, Mr. Timmy Tokwe Omoshui, joins me from the United Kingdom to make sense of uh, some issues raised in this document. Mr. Omoshui, thank you so much. Good afternoon, and it's really good to see you. Thank you for having me. It's always nice to be with you again today. Uh, specifically, the president talked about waivers. Yes, I know you studied that document and you have your comments around it. But specifically, uh, looking at the issue of removing tariffs on some specific food items like rice, like wheat, like sorghum, and of course, increasing production in country. Now, what impact do you see this having? Because Nigerians seem to want to see, uh, they want us to see results. They don't want to wait for that transition period. All they want to see is results. What do you make of it coming from the back of subsidy removal and, of course, liberalization of the Naira, which has put us where we are as we speak? All right. Thank you very much, Tolu. You know, two things are important that I've always emphasized on this program, food and energy security. I understand that tariff has been uh, removed on importation of food, and this is in a bit to address this rise in food prices. Inflation, food inflation is getting towards uh, 50%. And we are seeing in the market, we are seeing that prices of food items have more than doubled within the last just six months, right? That is very alarming. It's understandable why that decision was taken. However, there is no economy in the world that can actually import its way out of food insecurity or import its way or her way into food security, we still have to produce locally, right? As a matter of fact, you would see that economies globally are trying to ensure that they have more security when it comes to food and energy because we're in a world of um, um, slowdown, they call it globalization, right? Slowdown in globalization where economies are trying to ensure that there is um, sufficient food supply domestically before they can now consider other economies that need food supply. We saw that in 2022 when a lot of countries hoarded wheat, right? That led to spike in price of wheat across the globe. And even in Nigeria, we saw economies that also hoarded um, rice, palm oil, just to mention a few, and that led to the major surge we saw, right? So it's quite obvious that we have to look for sustainable measures, right, to address this dilemma because nothing is ultimately free. Once tariff is removed from food importation, the revenue goes somewhere. Because initially, you know, government would definitely get, would have gotten revenue from, from, from importation of food, and that would help to address fiscal deficit. But the fact that this revenue is now going to the importers of food, the question is, hope 
importers are also reducing the price of food because if there's no if there's no enough supply, food prices are mostly sticky, right? Food prices are mostly sticky, and we can see that in the market. We see prices. We, we know that prices have not really reflected the impact of this tariff. What does that mean? It means that government is losing revenue on imports on the one hand. On the other hand, some importers are, are also getting this revenue because it's more like it is zero-sum game. The negative part to the government, to the positive side to importers. So I think that on a sustainable basis, there has to be state of emergency in a, a great space so that we are able to achieve food security as soon and as early as possible. And not to even talk about the impact of this on the little efforts that we are trying to ration to ensure that the market is stable. Because a reduction, a reduction in tariff is increase in importation. We would also have to use our limited resources to address, you know, um, um, uh, imported um, what's it called imported um, food items. So, which is why I understand that on a short term basis, because for policy approach, you have your short term, medium term, and long term approach. I understand why it is important to address all of to ensure that food from Food items are to be imported, especially by the government, to intervene directly. Because imagine a situation where food is imported, right? And this will be consumed by people that can afford it and, and the less privileged in the society. It also means that even import duties, you know, um, reduction or elimination of import duties is a regressive tax because both the rich and poor will benefit from that. But a direct intervention by the government in terms of, you know, uh, giving food out would directly affect people, the most vulnerable in the society. Even though we have been seeing some of that, but it is not so efficient. And we are seeing that, you know, we've had cases where during this protest that, that, that just happened last week, that people would go to stores and, and see food that are not distributed. The question is, government has been intervening. I, I listened to uh, Governor Zulu, right? Talked about the fact that government had given him trailers of rice, fertilizer and all that. How many governors, how many of our leaders in Nigeria have all of these things and have not distributed? The question is, how do we make these people, you know, accountable and effective with policy intervention from the federal government? I think that is very important right now. But for, for, for food importation, I think we have to be efficient with it because on the one hand, government is losing revenue. The question is, if the revenue loss is coming to Nigerians and not ending with importers. Can't wait to start uh, this uh, conversation. Oil production is very important. That's where the dollars come from, at least at the moment. That's still one of our Nigeria's cash cow. And production at 1.6 million. That seems fairly good, not hitting OPEC's quota. Uh, but what do you make of this and about investment in that sector? The PIA is meant to open up. But you see what we've been going through in recent times back and forth between Dangote refinery issues and, of course, the NUPRC and, and all of that, the regulators. What do you make of, of that industry at, at the moment, not forgetting gas production and commercialization? Interesting, Tulu. I also noted that uh, the president mentioned uh, conversion into conversion of Venko into gas um, for gas usage, CNGs, yes. right? That is efficient. But then, I think the trajectory, you know, the way I illustrate Nigeria, Nigeria is like a fan, right? You know, when the light is interrupted, a fan does not just stop. Nigeria as a fan, you know, the interruption, the, the power supply has been interrupted even before 2015. For instance, the highest oil production that we've ever seen, in, you know, in the last, um, let's say, about 10 years or so, or more than that, was in 2010, in fact, in the last 30 years, 2010, when oil production was 2.5 million barrels per day, mm. right? In 2015, it moved down to two, and now we are talking about the early 1.6. My Ditolu population has grown, right? Our population in 2010 is not what we have to do, which means that oil production per Per, per population is extremely ridiculous when you compare to other economies that are that are called oil producing nations. For instance, Russia, 10 million barrels per day. The population is just about half of Nigeria, which means that Russia currently produces times 10 of what Nigeria produces, right? But the population is half. So which brings to the point where we have to emphasize that Nigeria is a poor country, 
Our oil production, yes, despite the fact that it's improving, we still have a long way to go, given the high level of obligation that the government is confronted with, from fiscal, uh, from infrastructure deficit, a lot of intervention to, to keep the economy afloat, our external debt obligation of more than one billion every year, and all that needs, in fact, how to also ensure that the FS market is stable, because if the foreign exchange market is not, if it's not stable, we won't be able to get sufficient investment that is critically needed in Nigeria at this point to drive the economy. So why that improvement is good, we have to make concerted efforts to tell investors that Nigeria is ready for business. And I have to say that there's difference between attitude and behavior. We in Nigeria, our leaders are asked to consistently ensure that our attitude aligns with behavior. Our attitude in terms of, oh, we are trying to, with Nigeria, is, we've been talking about the fact that Nigeria is ready for business. We see our important authority from the CBN, Minister, Minister of Finance, go to the London Stock Exchange and other platform in the world to market the country. But we have to ensure that our behavior, what we are doing at the moment, how companies within the shores of Nigeria, how they are, they are being uh, treated in terms of regulatory environment, for instance, you know, the fiscal, uh, 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 fiscal desk, that's Mr. Tawi Idili mentioned at Afro Invest program last week that Nigeria has over 100 taxes. And these taxes are not so efficient because all the taxes we are collecting all together is not up to what is obtainable in places like South Africa, Egypt, and other countries. So we have to, uh, at this point in time, align our you know, attitude with behavior, tell foreign investors that we are ready for business because irrespective of the uh, the conversation around, oh, uh, the cleaner energy and all that, fossil fuel is still extremely important. As a matter of fact, what kept Russia flow during the whole oh, um, 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 uh, uh, sanction was because Russia has energy security. As a matter of fact, despite all of those sanctions, Russia ruby was, was very strong. And what is keeping all advanced economies afloat is because they have sufficient oil supply. So I think that is, is important. It's important that we have um, we have uh, inflows into that sector, right, so as to quickly drive development. However, we should also continually, you know, consistently look at a balanced growth because Nigeria have been talking about oil production for a long time and, you know, economists have, have put forward the impact, the negative impact of resource costs and dust disease, the impact of, uh, the impact of Oil discovery on major sectors of the economy because the sector is not is not so efficient. At what point in Nigeria? At, at what point in Nigeria will we begin to look away from oil? It is a conversation that we need to have. Norway, for instance, the country has sovereign wealth fund of over one trillion dollars. One trillion, um, uh, one trillion dollars, right? How did they get the money from natural resources? They ensure that they have, they, their budget will only take from the return of oil, not spending oil revenue. But in Nigeria, oil is a major component of our, of our fiscal plan, which means we have been seeing a lot of volatilities here and there in terms of revenue. Government is not able to meet expenditure. And on the back of that, you see how our fiscal deficit has grown substantially. It has grown massively. In fact, going by what the president said in terms of the revenue expectation, what the government had done for this year, you know, the president mentioned that uh, the government had done about 9.1 trillion naira in terms of revenue for this year, way more than everything that was generated last year. However, if you look at it on the real term, it's way lower, right? And we are also looking at a budget of about 34, 34 trillion. If you convert that to uh, dollars is a lot, right? Compared to the fiscal deficit, is even more than what we have seen before in Nigeria. So I think it is time, as much as oil sector is going to revamp the economy, Nigeria must begin to look at other sector. We have to focus on them so that we are we are very resilient because we are in a world where we will continue to grapple with volatility shocks. It's now becoming reoccurring. You know, 2020 we saw one, 2022. Now we are talking about war in the Middle East. We don't know what we are expecting in 2025. In, in, in a world where uncertainty is very high, energy security, diversification of the economy and revenue sources. In fact, Middle East economies are now investing heavily in technology in other sectors because they know that for our sector, the volatility is not good for an economy that wants to be stable. 
All right, Mr. Omoshi, uh, almost finally. Now, uh, this speech, there are a lot of angles to it, and I'm sure you will agree with me. Let's talk about interventions to states. 570 billion naira has been released to states, and many analysts like you have argued that uh, many times we look too much to the federal government, expect too much from the federal government. Uh, at the moment, fuck has improved. You know what it is every month and what it used to be before now. What sort of collaboration, what sort of conversation are you expecting from states? We've seen Lagos State taking the step. Uh, free health, uh, transportation, 25% off, markets and all of that. What more do you think other states need to do to help support the presidency or the federal government to achieve stability as we move out of this, this season? Yes, I think two of my points, I'll say two factors are still very important. How do people get access to energy sufficiently? Energy is a complementary demand. People demand poor PMS because they need to transport. People demand PMS because they need stable electricity. And on food, people don't just, uh, you know, the people need to eat, right? Irrespective of how they get the food, if it, if it comes free and all that. So, states go not. The government must be involved in, in, in kind of similar strategy that is playing out in Lagos. It is not, we have to see it such that there are public transport that is highly subsidized. That, that is the most efficient and progressive way to address this kind of crisis. Because this is a crisis in a situation where food prices are jumping, doubling in just two, two months, three months, and energy prices is also you know, jumping substantially. But people are agitating for subsidy. However, we have explained exhaustively that subsidy is regressive because the only way to ensure that, uh, because uh, both the rich and the poor will benefit. So, state governments in other states should also, you know, should also key into interventions, public transport that are largely free or at a very discount rate. Because, it, uh, you know, otherwise social unrest will continue. Otherwise. Productivity, a lack of productivity will continue because in a, a population that is unstable, that is grappling with social unrest, that, that are not motivated. You no, know, the impact of this thing is not just about the, the, the short term. If you have a lot of people that are not motivated because of high cost of living, it will also affect future revenue even for the state government. But in a situation where people are able to commit to commute to work easily, they have access to food. It will affect, ultimately affect productivity across different strata of the state. So I think that at this point in time, state governors or governments must be committed to interventions, giving food out for free. People are really poor, giving food out for free. And if the food supply is coming from the federal government, I think it's high time the federal government began to create a platform where they monitor all of it. it could even, the government could even decide to use maybe ID card voters card or something, some form of identity, because it's an important issue. Nigerians, uh, Nigerians are bothered about a situation where government intervention gets to state government and doesn't get to the people. So I think there has to be accountability. I don't know uh, how many states in Nigeria also have their uh, financials. A number of them don't even have financials. So you can see, oh, government gave one trillion naira. This is what the state go government is spending money on. So we need more of transparency, accountability and that's what you know people will be able to hold they will be able to know how to hold governors or go, state governments accountable in fact if the federal government is able to mandate state to ensure that their financials or there's a level of transparency in how their fiscals are it will reduce so much burden on the federal government because say, in a uh, citizen or uh, uh, people that stay in the state would be able to understand that oh this governor this particular state government has spent the money judiciarily or it has been, you know, uh, 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 spent lavishly. So I think that state governments are critical to the most effective reform in Nigeria to address the current um, um, uh, 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 uncertainty and the crisis that we are currently seeing. So much. It's good to start the week with you on the program. Mr. Temi Tokwe Omoshu is an investment strategy and management senior associate uh, with Afri Invest West Africa. He joined us live from the UK. Thank you. Have a great week. All right, then. We'll continue with this. Yes. And look at other 
uh, areas around that speech, talking about revenue issues, talking about debt servicing issues. A lot was raised there. And also, the support for manufacturers. 75 billion naira ought to have been disbursed. All of this, uh, we'll look at it on the flip side of the show. And the Director General, Lagos Chamber of Commerce and Industry, uh, is my guest. She would be joining via Zoom for us to continue this conversation. Dr. Chinyere Almona joins us after this breather. This is Business Nigeria. We'll be right back.